take over the session. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, uh, Salim Saab for uh, organizing this lecture. I should also thank uh, the uh, Presidency College uh, for considering my name. Uh, let me start by apologizing to all the uh, senior academics, if they have joined, that my lecture uh, today or my talk today uh, would be very basic. Uh, I won't actually be going into the intricacies of uh, the medieval Indian architecture uh, because Salim Saab uh, gave me the brief that I have to talk about the entire medieval uh, period and uh, tell the students about the basics of the architecture as it prevailed during that period of time. Uh, as uh, you may know that if I start going into any of the details, it needs uh, you know, a number of hours to complete uh, 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 and to talk about what this medieval Indian architecture was. And that is why uh, today I just selected a theme which is basic elements of medieval Indian architecture. Uh, in other words, what we would be doing uh, through the 40, 50 minutes or whatever time I take, uh, we would be dealing uh, uh, with uh, the techniques, the material, uh, certain important architectural elements, as well as uh, some of the preferred plants uh, during the medieval period. In this, we would be dealing both the Sultanate as well as the Mughal period. Let us just talk, uh, start this topic by putting up this question, what is medieval Indian architecture? Uh, although a very simple question, but there are very complex answers to it. Uh, you know, there was a time when uh, the medieval Indian architecture was known as Saracenic architecture. Would it be correct to call it that? Uh, incidentally, in the uh, uh, you know uh, last few decades, this term is not very popular. To tell these students. Saracenic just means anything which is concerned with the Arabs. Uh, the uh, you know you know it well that uh, the Arab uh, you know profess Islam and the depiction of life, animals, human beings uh, that's looked down upon. Uh, so, uh, for example, in the Indian context, you would get sculptures, uh, you would get a depiction of, uh, you know, life. Uh, but as far as the architecture which was developing under the Arab influence was concerned, the Saracenic architecture was concerned, and this was incidentally a term given by the Europeans, uh, the idols, sculptures, depiction of life was missing. So that was one of the terms which was put forward and it was said that uh, the uh, Indian architecture was in fact Saracenic architecture. And from that also, you know, there was another derivative, Indo-Saracenic. Indo-Saracenic uh, actually was applied by uh, the, uh, our colonial masters to a typical type of architecture which started developing from 18th century onwards, where there was a mixture of the British uh, the uh, Indian elements. So it started being called as Indo-Saracenic. Typical example would be the Lucknow architecture. But then sometimes the term Indo-Saracenic was also applied 
to the entire gamut of architecture which uh, came to be established in India from the Sultanate period onwards. Another very, uh, you know, uh, um, very popular term which has been used is Islamic architecture. Uh, they, they generally say some, there are certain books which have been written in which it is claimed that medieval Indian architecture was nothing but Islamic architecture. Uh, now, how would you define the various types of temples which were constructed uh, during this medieval period? Uh, how would you call them Islamic for that matter? And I'm not going into the details of that, but you know, in one of my articles, I have tried to argue that even the term Islamic is very problematic. Uh, you know, uh, Islam would invoke a religion, and I believe that uh, architecture has no religion. You know, sometimes there are certain features which are identified as Muslim. There are certain features which are, uh, you know, identified as uh, Hindu. Uh, that is a very, uh, you know, wrong type of identification. Uh, suffice to say that uh, the dome is not Muslim. The trade is not Hindu. So this term also uh, should not be applied to the Islamic. So would be the case with the term Indo-Islamic. Indo-Islamic would mean that Islamic architecture which was used in the Indian subcontinent. So there were many aspects uh, which had nothing to do with Islam but were prevalent during the medieval period in India. And it was not only the religious structures which were being built. So uh, again, just like Islamic, the term Indo-Islamic is also a term which I uh, uh, feel that should not be used. The actual term with which we should stick with is the medieval Indian architecture. Simple. Isko aap na Islam se jodiye, na kisi bazaap se jodiye. Don't relate it with the Arabs, don't relate it with Islam. Uh, just call it the medieval Indian architecture because uh, for example, there are a lot of elements within the Indian architecture which are typically Indian in character and they have got nothing to do with Islam. I don't know whether I'll be able to uh, reach that stage during the uh, lecture or not, but suffice to say here, let me explain it at this particular juncture itself, that sometimes Taj Mahal is supposed to be an Islamic building. You know, there's a misconception. Uh, among uh, those who read the textbooks. Uh, Akbari architecture is supposed to be an architecture which is more inspired by the Indian traditions, whereas the architecture uh, under Taj Mahal typically, the Taj Mahal is taken to be a typical example where there is much Islamic Central Asian Iranian influence. I would uh, submit before you that actually it is the opposite. The, the uh, you know, a type of arches, the type of pillars, the type of decorations which are present in the Taj or in the Shah Jahani architecture are more properly speaking derived from the old ancient Buddhist architecture rather than the Central Asian or Iranian. So, uh, 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 in short, I would just uh, recommend to all these students that please, these uh, terms are in different books, in different textbooks, in Saracen, in Islam, in Indo-Islam. Uh, please, uh, uh, you know, stop using them. Simple term, uh, which will encompass all the type of buildings, all the type of, you know, construction which were taking place from, uh, say, uh, 800 uh, uh, onwards down to uh, uh, the, the, the establishment of the colonial rule in India, that all period would be represented by a simple term, uh, medieval Indian architecture. Now having, uh, you know, in a way, uh, uh, defined the term, let me go to certain of the basics of how to uh, gauge what, what was medieval. Now, for example, take the material, the material through which 
the uh, medieval structures were constructed. We know, I mean, before you in this slide, there are a large number of materials uh, which uh, you know uh, I have put up before you. For example, mud, the simplest of the material, kachi uh, mitti, you know that uh, 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 terracotta through which the mud walls, the thatched roof, uh, you know cottages are built. That is one of the materials. Uh, naturally, it was preferred during the earlier periods, but then it also continued during the medieval period. So we can't rule it out. The mud architecture was very much a part of it. Most of the villages, the residential, uh, you know, huts of the villages still continue to be made of mud. So was the wood. Uh, wood was also one of these, uh, you know, material through which the buildings were constructed since time immemorial. Uh, we know that from uh, the Morgan periods onwards, we start getting of wood being used uh, in palatial structures, in gateways, in palisades, in city walls, so on and so forth. Uh, the wood continued down to the medieval period. It continued even in the modern period. So wood is one of the uh, you know uh, uh, material through which the uh, uh, structures. Similar was the stone. We know that most of these structures were built of stone. And, uh, you know, uh, let me not give examples, but starting from the ancient period, coming down to even uh, uh, very late in uh, history, till the 19th century, you would get examples of the stone architecture in, through the entire history of the country. Uh, something which is written in between the bricks, bricks was something which, although known during the uh, ancient period, who can forget the Kushana bricks? Who can forget the Mauryan bricks? The brick architecture was very much there. We know that the bricks were used uh, in the most uh, remote past of the Indian subcontinent. But still, it was during the medieval period that the material brick became one of the preferred materials when it was used along with a new type of mortar which was introduced. In fact, the modern period is symbolized by the introduction of a binding material which is known as lime mortar. Uh, all those who uh, have studied a little bit of, you know, uh, uh, archaeology uh, uh, would know that in the area of Sindh, uh, where uh, the Muslim, uh, Muslim invasion, the invasions of the Turks and Ghaznavites occurred uh, much before they started occurring in the Indo-Gangetic plain, in that region, the lime mortar makes its uh, appearance from 10th to 11th century onwards. And we start getting buildings uh, which are made of brick, which are held together with this new type of uh, lime mortar. In the Indo Gangetic Basin, for example, in the area of Agra, in the area of Delhi, uh, the lime mortar was introduced sometime around the 12th century AD and not before that. I would refer to uh, you one of the uh, very important books which have been uh, written uh, by an archaeologist uh, who incidentally was the person who excavated uh, the Babri Masjid at Ayodhya in 2003. Now uh, he has a book, uh, Delhi at the Threshold. It's a very important book on the history of Delhi, arche archaeological history of Delhi. Now, he there, very perceptively, he writes that as soon as we start getting lime water, now we can say that the Rajput period is over and now the Delhi Sultanate has been established. And it is not only uh, B.R. Mani, uh, the uh, name of the archaeologist, he was also the uh, heading the uh, you know uh, ASI uh, 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 till a few years back. Uh, he was he is also at the moment 
the director general of the national museum of india at uh, delhi uh, uh, the the, the uh, person who actually uh, carried out uh, the 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 so called uh, you know excavations at ayodhya and trying to prove that uh, there was a temple out there but when he wrote his book on delhi uh, he wrote it as you know uh, an archaeologist and he pointedly uh, states there that the lime mortar is something through which one can distinguish the medieval period now if you read the articles and works which have been done by professor irfan abi in a number of articles irfan abi to uh, to have tried to argue that these two materials jo uh, you know there is a term in north india i don't know uh, what is uh, that term is in uh, bengal lakhori eet uh, very small short small brick through which most of these you know uh, medieval structures were built they were held together by this lime mortar in which there was an addition of surki that is you know powder of born bricks as well as gypsum so lime mortar uh, which was made of fresh lime which was boiled uh, uh, gypsum was added to it in a desert material and surki was added to it there are a large number of you know mughal miniatures where constructional activity has been shown for example the agra fort is shown to be as being built but the poor sikri is shown that you know building construction out there is taking place and there there are scenes where you know masons are mixing the mortar laying out the bricks uh, transporting the stone material to form the you know walls of these uh, palatial structures and where this mortar is being mixed you can make out that red colored surkhi that white lime mortar and a paste like thing which is being added to that which is gypsum so this you know uh, just remember that as soon as you start getting uh, the evidence of lime mortar gypsum and surkhi being used as a binding material to hold the bricks with which the structures were being constructed we can identify that particular building or structure as a medieval structure now uh, that 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 is as far as i would tell you about the material which is typical of the medieval age in india now let us come to uh, the three basic techniques through which buildings are made most of you uh, would have heard these terms any one of you who has read a bit of architecture would have heard these three uh, you know terms trabeate which is the simplest of the techniques where uh, you have two you know uh, stones forming the wall on top of that that is a heavy lateral piece of stone which is kept on top of that which is this is a trabeate method which was the earliest technique through which buildings were being constructed throughout the world even in india so in most of the you know uh, uh, ancient period in india trabeate is the method uh, which has been employed uh, to make constructions this is a very, very important technique is the technique which is known as arcuate arcuate is a technique where in, instead of having a flat roof with the lateral stone which is kept on the top you have the uh, you know uh, a bow shaped you know a uh, roofing which is being done an arch which is being made i'll come to the arch later on but this was the arcuate technique was a very revolutionary technique which uh, was introduced generally in india during the medieval period now let me caution you here uh, you know sometimes when uh, irfan abi for example wrote about this uh, arch made uh, its appearance during the medieval period 
So someone would point out to one particular isolated site and would say, look here, waha pe ek arch bilti. So there are two cautions there. Number one, if something is not being duplicated again and again, it is not being popularized, ho sakta hai kahin uska istamal kiya. For example, lime mortar is not totally absent during the uh, ancient period at all. We do have examples of lime mortar being used. Lekin when it is being used in larger quantities, it has been popularized, we say, that it was in uh, you know medieval period that lime mortar became a popular means of construction. Similarly, one may find one or two arch here and there, but basically, arcuate is a style which comes to be established. Uh, it is only during the period when bricks became popular, when the lime mortar, a new type of adhesive uh, was discovered, and using these two things, the arcuate style started getting popularized in India. It had a shape of an arch. Now, when both these techniques met each other, radiate and arcuate, where the technique remained the old, where there was a lateral piece of stone, I'll explain this. But the shape was new. That type of new, you can say, hybrid, which came to exist, was known as corbelling. The corbel. So, if you are technique wise, I will tell you that the corbel is what we should say is that trabeate, corbel, and arcuate, because corbel is also sometimes known as false arch. For example, in the Qutub uh, Minar complex, the Qubbatul Islam that has been used, where the shape is of an arch, but actually the thing which is being constructed is uh, still the old method. Now before you, I am just showing you a slide uh, for you, all those who are new to architecture, to understand what is Treviate, for example. Uh, this is Stonehenge monument. It has nothing to do with India, but a very good example to show okay, what is Treviate. Where, imagine that these, you know, uh, Vertical pieces of stones are the walls, and those horizontal pieces of stones are big slabs. Uh, imagine them to be the roofs. And this is how trabeated entrances are being made, trabeated structures are being made. What is happening here is that the full weight of the stone on the top is fa falling on the pillars or on the wall itself. Uh, so much so that, that when there is so much of pressure, the result would be that the structure would come down. From India, I am giving you this example from the Qubbatul Islam Mosque, uh, where you see this, you know, uh, galleries of the mosque uh, with uh, the, the, the uh, shafts of the temple pillars, two shafts of a pillar kept on top of the other to give the requisite height and on top of that you have these trabeated roofs where the pressure of all these roofs would be falling below. Or for that matter another uh, example where it is much more clear for you to see. Uh, this is from Rajasthan. Uh, it is uh, from near Ajmer. Arhai Din Ka Jhopra. Uh, you know, a, a, a mosque which was constructed soon after the Qubbatul Islam Mosque. Qubbatul Islam Mosque was started during the period of Qutubuddin Abak, but then added upon during the period of Iltitvish. Now, this Arhaidin Kajhopra, this particular mosque at Ajmer, is built during the period of See how the roofings have been done. See how the pillars are supporting the roof, the stone slabs to, uh, which are resting on these you know, uh, pillars. And what are these pillars? They are again are the temple shafts. 
uh, if at Quwatul Islam Mosque there were two shafts, one atop the other, here you find three uh, shafts kept one on top of the other, and on top of that there is a frame of stone slabs, and on that you have uh, the, the beams, and on the beams you have the stone slabs forming the roof. If you remove one of the pillars, the roof would fall. Imagine if this roof was of wood, then what would happen? Uh, I don't know whether you have seen it or not. All those who have got some 18th or 19th century, you know, old type of bangalows in your villages with, uh, you know, wooden roofs, you would have seen that the roof, uh, you know, caves in. It becomes bent uh, from the top like this. And so to hold it, you again have to put up a new pillar uh, so that the roof doesn't fall. Because the full weight of the, this type of a roofing is on the walls and on the pillars. In the core belt uh, arch, the same defect remains. One more thing which I would like to point out, that in this old trabeated method, what is happening is that large expansive halls, open halls cannot be built. There would be halls which are pillared. Hmm. But large open structures cannot be built. Very high structures cannot be built. If you have a corbelled arch, in other words, if you ask the mason to make an arch, he only knows the trabeate way. This is how he would make an arch. This is how, this is the technique which has been used in the Qumbatul Islam Mosque, for example. There, uh, what the architect is doing is, the, what the mason is doing is, he is basically staggering these each and every stone piece. To a flat roof, he has made various stages, mein, steps mein stagger kar diya hai. but the ultimate result is the same. The weight of the ceiling or the weight of the arch or the weight of the dome, conical dome, for example, uh, here you see the conical domes. They are also built on the same technique. Sir, may I interrupt you? Uh, we are not able to see your PowerPoint, sir. Why? I don't know, sir, because uh, I just... Uh, now we realize that you are the continuously showing the PowerPoint, but uh, it is not presented. Uh, sorry, sir. Sorry, start representing. Uh, is it now? Visible? Sorry, start representing. Present now, sir. Is it... Uh, can you see it? No. No, sir. Sir, not yet. Sorry, start representing. Uh, start what? Present now. Representing. Sir. Present. 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 How to do that? Uh, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Rizvi, if you uh, look at the bottom, if you scroll your mouse at the bottom of your screen, yes. uh, feet on the bottom right, there's a little button that says present now. Can okay. You at the very bottom. Do you see where there's the microphone, the little telephone icon, and then the uh, video? Yes, there we go. Yes. Is it coming? Yes. Yes, sir. Oh, my God. So why didn't you tell me in the beginning? So is it now available? Yes, it is. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, sir you know, I need to explain this. You have... I mean, this is, for example, from the stone hand, which I was just talking about uh, for you to understand. Sir, slide show kar dijega thoda, sir. Taki is ho ah, ah, ek minute, ek minute. Fine? Ji, sir, fine. Uh, now, oh, what, what happened? Uh, sir, is your present to everyone. Uh, is it visible? Now it is visible. Now, for example, here is the slide where I was talking about the the uh, al Islam uh, Sahan, the courtyard and the galleries around it, where the you know temple pillars have been used uh, to have a flat roof on them. You can see the beams on which the 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 uh, trabeated roof is resting, and you can see the conical domes. This is what I was talking about. 
Now here was the uh, you know uh, the Arhai Din Ka Jhopla, uh, where uh, I was. What I told you is that if you can, if the slide is visible to you, that uh, you know uh, three uh, pillar shafts have been used to give the height to the chamber. What I said was that in this striated structure, large halls. Open halls cannot be built. For example, here what you can see is it's just a pillared hall. Uh, beams are, and you can see the shafts, and you have you know a flat roof. The whole you know weight of the roof is resting on these pillars. Now here the corbel arch, uh, where uh, now the trebiate roof. Has been given the shape of an arch. It is not an arch proper; it's a false arch, because here the flat roof has been staggered into various levels. You know, each level of the uh, you know just protruding stones, one atop the other, so much so that that at this level it's filled up. But the weight of each and every piece. Is still falling on the walls of the structure, so that is one of the you know uh, basic defects that very expensive structures cannot be built, and you know shikars can be built through this method, and we know that a number of shikaras in the temples were built in Kuwaitul Islam Mosque. The same uh, you know trebia roof was built. For example, as I said, that ancient India. Here is a tip, uh, typical example. Uh, you see this, and you can find it here. This is the shape of an arch, but this is not an arch proper. It's a corbelled arch, where the weight of each and every stone piece is falling, falling on the walls of the structure itself. The same technique you will find in this Kubatul Islam Mosque. The screen of the Kuwaitul Islam Mosque. Uh, this arch has the shape of an arch, but if you look closely, the same type of you know technique has been used as it has been used here. So यहाँ पे भी जो arch का form दे दिया गया है, लेकिन technique वही पुरानी है जो चल रही है. For example, again in अढ़ाई दिन का झोपड़ा. Again, you will find that apparently it appears to be an arch with, you know, arabesque with Quranic verses uh, written all over it, floral designs, and so on and so forth. But, but the technique remains the same, where you know, uh, protruding stones, you know, one step, yahan ko par yahan tak, fir ek layer which is protruding forward, another layer which is again protruding. further forward and in the same fashion this dome is being constructed so uh here for example uh jo usme nazar nahi aa raha tha carving ki wajah se you can see it in this particular arch typical saltanat period arch but a corbel arch the same type of arch which is found in qubbatul islam Which is formed in Arhai Din Ka Jhopra and the earlier buildings. Here, as you can see, that each piece of stone, जो subsequent जो layers हैं, वो बाहर की तरफ निकाल के रखी गई हैं. And ultimately, on the top, you have a piece which covers it all. So you have the shape of an arch, but the technique remains the old trebiate one, where the full weight of this whole area would be following on the structure itself the true arch on the other hand the preferred mode of construction during the medieval period was this radiating arch an arch in which the weight of the stones radiated in all sort of directions where there were two type of stones which were used the keystone 
which is almost you know triangular shaped which is stops these two spans which are formed by stones which are known as voiceers these are also you know wedge shaped pieces of stones each wedge shaped piece of stone is held together by this keystone if you remove this keystone the whole structure would collapse but till this triangular piece of stone is there this type of you know arch would remain standing so now you can give a breadth of kitna bhi bada chauda lamba hall aapko chahiye ho using this uh, true arch this radiating arch you can have the span of the room you can give the height depend kya karta hai ke voices mein kitna aap usko edge de rahe hain uska wedge kitna hai kitna ke zyada hai kitna kam hai so you can accordingly shape your building it is also the same technique through which the domes started being constructed here again you find an example the comparison of a false arch and a true arch how the pieces of stones would be used uh, in a false arch and then in a true arch now one of the first structures in medieval period where we encounter the true arch is this building which is known as the tomb of sultan balban it was constructed around uh, 1287 uh, it survives you know this particular photograph was taken by me uh, only around 2 years back and as you can see here that here a true arch has been made and then we will also see that although the dome has disappeared but it this uh, the dome over this building was also of the true variety however the first intact building where both the arch and the dome survive is this alai darwaza which is situated very near to the qutub minar this is built during the period of alauddin khalji here you can say that this is the first surviving true dome which exists in the indian uh, or in the, you can say under the sultanate a delhi sultan period in north india now in other words there are three types of architectural elements the arch the vault and the dome Uh, i have already shown that this was the arch one of the first arches from the sultanate period of the tomb of sultan balban which is near uh, the uh, the qutub complex it is in the archaeological park and as is very visible here that voiceers and a keystone have been used to make these type of arches or for example this is you know a typical decorated arch portion of a building which survives uh, uh, of, uh, in jaunpur the sharqi architecture again sultanate period a little late 15th century but again we find that now full fledged you know uh, true arches as well as here you find the old trebiated you know entrances are being used in the same building it was one of the peculiar features of the tughlaq architecture which continued to be followed by the sharqis and in sharqi architecture the the the, the uh, you know uh, uh, the tughlaq architecture had a very great influence so in in spite of a few differences for example high propylons uh, uh, such a uh, square type of bastions on the sides 
most of the other features uh, during this uh, Sharti period remained the uh, those which were preferred during uh, the Tughlaq period. Now, as far as uh, uh, the uh, you know arches during the Mughal period is concerned, uh, uh, some change took place uh, after the establishment of the Mughal Empire, and a new type of an arch came to be established. You see, if you agar compare kare, uh, for example, uh, this arch and here, uh, this type of an arch is a typical Iranian arch, which is also known, uh, you know, as a four-centered arch. It was from the period of Akbar. It was used to such a large extent that actually people forgot that it had Iranian origins and it came to be known popularly as the Mughal arch. It was a four centered you know, compass or circle banai, to banega, banega. Or fir ka jo dimensions hai, wo alag hai. So in fact, this is uh, there are four centers in this arch, and that is why it is known as uh, you know a four-centered arch, which was uh, you know uh, first perfected in Iran, but from Iran it was borrowed uh, by the Mughal architects, and throughout you know for example here in Humayun's tomb, you will find all these arches, uh, you know. Uh, being made and under Akbar, they were used so profusely that by the end of the 50 years reign of Akbar, uh, people started calling it as the Mughal arch. But then under Shah Jahan, a new variety of arches started developing, which are known as multi foliated arches, which had cusps within them. Hmm. I remember and you know there is a lotus flower which is made here, here, here at every point where you would find where the arch culminates you will find a lotus uh, you know flower being depicted. This particular multifoliated arch is derived from Buddhist architecture. Jo chaitya windows ka jo form hua karta tha, ye vaha se aur ye Buddhist architecture mein ye use ki gai thi. This is, they are derived from that particular ancient Indian architecture. But now, uh, they, 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 although they were derived from ancient Indian architecture, but now they were made in a new form so that now these cusp multifoliated arches came to be known as Shah Jahani arches. And as you can see that there are small cusps, all these cusps are made by using the voices and ultimately here they culminate in a flower. Uh, there are, you know, certain, you know, these type of arches which are Egyptian forms of arches, but again derived from the Chaitya windows. Uh, they were used uh, during the period of Shah Jaha. They are not found, uh, you know, under Akbar. So, ek tarikhe se, wahi arch, jo uh, ek uh, corbelled arch se shuru hui thi, wo barte barte, what we find is that a number of types of arches started being made. And then, of course, as far as domes are concerned, there were not only domes, but vaults which were made using this particular technique of architecture. Now, for example, here you find that here, uh, this is the entrance to the uh, Red Fort of Delhi, where there is a market. Uh, now, it, this has been, you know, uh, renovated and it did that. Uh, uh, its uh, old, old glory has been, you know, uh, given back to it by the ASI uh, 
uh, uh, which has cleaned it from all the you know 19th and 20th century uh, uh, plasters and cement which was used to cover uh, these places but mark here that this is how uh, you know a new type of you know uh, 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 ceilings were given using uh, these arches intersecting arches uh, which formed small vaults in between and a series of vaults were used to give form to a passage similarly here this is a painting uh, this is from the sultanate period uh, uh, it is from the adina mosque uh, in bengal but again you find that here again once again the type of vaulting which came to be established and here uh, is the vault uh, of a temple at vrindavan the gobind dev temple one of the very famous temples which were built during the reign of akbar here also we find that uh, the, uh, we will come to another slide but uh, here also uh, the, the these vaultings uh, were accomplished and then of course the domes uh, what we have Uh, is these uh, early period uh, domes of the sultanate period the khalji period domes followed uh, by you know uh, you will find that there is no kalasha on top of this uh, but then here a sort of a kalash starts making an appearance in punjab we have domes uh, which are you know uh, uh, you can say early a uh, period of uh, the establishment of the mogal empire this particular structure uh, is uh, uh, in uh, sarhind and here instead of a kalash you have a roshandan incidentally in the only surviving mosque of babur's period the kabuli bagh mosque at panipat there also instead of a kalash over the dome we have this uh, you know uh, roshandan where you can see a small cupola with you know spaces in between from uh, through which the uh, you know air and light could enter into the room these were you know type uh, of domes and preferred roshandans which were found in the central asian architecture and uh, uh, they, they, there are two or three surviving examples all in the region of punjab uh, uh, one in haryana for example kabuli bagh mosque is now haryana although it was also once upon a time part of punjab to so, wahan ke upar kalash ke alawa earlier period mein this is how but later on what we find is a particular type of you know a derivative from the temple architecture uh, the kalasha which was added uh, to the dome what we also find is that from such type of domes ultimately the dome transform into uh, for example uh, in uh, during the period of the tughlaqs uh, there is a particular uh, you know structure in delhi now in a very dilapidated uh, condition known as the tomb of khane jahan talangani and there uh, for the first time we start getting uh, you know uh, a double dome which was uh, you know further developed in the uh, tomb of humayu and the most perfect form of a double dome was found as the taj mahal and in this double dome what you can see is that there is an inner shell which is coming so that Uh, to the room over which it is being built and the outer shell of the dome which is lighter the actual dome is here uh, architectural dome this is just a shell outer shell and this outer uh, shell uh, you know uh, uh, gives a balance to the building from outside so now uh, from the mughal period onwards in most of the monumental structures which are uh, also octagonal in shape uh, what we start getting a new type of domes 
which are you know double domes some of these double domes for example at the taj uh, which is now before you is a bulbous dome it just like a guava shaped dome which we start getting in its perfect form you know the neck actually the neck of the dome actually hides the uh, inner shell of the actual dome and uh, there is a space in between uh, 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 there is a door in fact if, uh, it has been now uh, since been closed but uh, if you want you can go if uh, asi allows you you can even go and walk up this space because this is all vacant so this outer shell becomes light and it is not at all surprising that for 300 or 400 years jo ek dome itna bhari aur bada nazar aata hai actually it is quite light and that is why it survives for such a long period of time let me come now to certain of the mosque plants uh, there are a number of varieties of mosques uh, the plants which entered into the indian south our the initial mosque plants so uh, the uh, one of the first as you know is the qubbatul islam mosque at delhi now especially the mosques which were built in the indo gangetic basin this area agra or uh, delhi they are all mosques which have a particular plan a centrally located courtyard on the western side the main chamber the main liwan the prayer chamber and then on the other three sides there are galleries or verandas or chambers with openings gateways given to it this type of a plan is an iranian style of plan an iranian mosque plan where there is a centrally uh, located courtyard with constructions on all these Uh, this is the form of a mosque plan which you would find, for example, at Qubatul Islam Mosque or the other mosques in North India. Then there was a, another type of a plan uh, which came to uh, exist in India, uh, especially from the period of Feroz Shah Tughlaq, the multi courtyard plan, where now there was no central courtyard at all, but there were multiples of courtyards. For example. in most of these uh, uh, feroz shah tughlaq mosques in delhi you find four courtyards and around all those four courtyards you will find constructions so much so that the courtyard uh, comes in the center of the building itself they were known as the multi courtyard and then uh, uh, in certain areas for example in bengal you know that uh, in uh, the in uh, bengal sultanate from 12th century onwards up till the period of aurangzeb uh, the, there was a bengal sultanate sometimes independent sometimes under the control of the moguls actually from akbar's period onwards the bengal sultanate uh, was no more there but their architecture which had been established during the sultanate of bengal continued uh in that area the special typical examples of that you will find in the, the modern district of malda for example in india bangladesh pe bhi wo milta hai lekin india mein agar aap dekhenge your uh, place where you live go to uh, district malda in gaur and pandwa sharif you will find those mosques and you will find that unlike the north indian mosques these mosques are uh, you know structures without any courtyard courtyard ya open space is there outside it but it is not a centrally located courtyard around which the mosques are built and then lastly i would also uh, discuss with you uh, you know uh, that in india especially from uh, the 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 uh, mughal period onwards uh, typical type of mosques came to be established in the indian subcontinent which are not found anywhere outside the indian subcontinent by indian subcontinent all of you know that what would include countries like india itself pakistan uh, you know 
बांग्लादेश ये जो पूरा एरिया था जो इंडियन सब कॉन्टिनेंट के नाम से जाना जाता था वहाँ एक वैरायटी मॉस की मिलती है और उस टाइप की मॉस्क यू वॉन्ट गेट आउटसाइड फॉर एग्जाम्पल यू गो टू ईरान सेंट्रल एशिया और एनी वेयर इन दर्ल्ड वंस यू लीव दिस बाउंड्री ऑफ द इंडियन सब कॉन्टिनेंट दो दिस टाइप ऑफ मॉस्क यू विल नॉट गेट एंड दैट इज वाई वेरी हेजिटेंटली बट आई यूज द टर्म टेम्पलर मॉस्क बिकॉज हेयर देर आर सर्टन फीचर्स विच वर बॉरोड फ्रॉम द लोकल इंडियन टेम्पल ट्रेडिशन फॉर एग्जाम्पल यू वुड फाइंड ऑल ऑफ यू नो जब भी हम लोग मॉस्क की बात करते हैं वेदर इट इज द जामा मस्जिद ऑफ फतेहपुर सीकरी और दैट ऑफ डेली और दैट ऑफ लाहौर और दैट ऑफ बनारस और दैट ऑफ एनी प्लेस इन राजस्थान और अलीगढ़ और एनी वेयर ऑल दीज मॉस्क द लार्जर वराइटीज हैव ट्रिपल डोम्स तीन डोम्स विद द सेंट्रल डोम बींग higher than the other two uh, two uh, domes so what i say is uh, that uh, this was a type of a design which is derived from uh, the indian concept of trinity uh, where uh, the triple is there uh, secondly in these mosque indian variety of mosques which came to be established from the um, uh, mogal period onwards there is a hierarchy uh, at the lowest level is the area outside the mosque then you uh, climb these steps you come to the courtyard from the courtyard there is another step of uh, you know series of steps although not more than 5 or 6 3 and 3 to 5 you may say but again uh, there is uh, at a higher level the prayer chamber the western prayer chamber the liwan of the mosque the liwan of the mosque itself would be divided into three sections uh, uh, you know you would find uh, a central uh, unit portion uh, the central area uh, of the mosque with a larger arch a larger dome a higher ceiling which is flanked uh, by two aisles the nave in between and the two aisles the aisles are also surmounted with domes but those two domes are lower than the central one so a hierarchy the the western portion of the mosque the highest the western central portion the highest the side portions single storied and you uh, the the courtyard uh, you know at the lowest but below the courtyard the actual ground outside the uh, you know mosque so uh, these uh, typical type of mosques are known as what i start calling them as templar mosques because such type of mosques mosques are not found outside the indian subcontinent but let me start with this variety which is the 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 uh, iranian style of mosques for example before you is the 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 arhai din ka chopra at ajmer a square centrally located courtyard uh, the, the 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 sides have disappeared only the western chamber remains of the western cham chamber and the uh, uh, screen fronting it remains but as whatever remains you can see that it was the square uh, you know uh, structure uh, uh, which was you know typical of uh, a variety of mosques uh, derived from 8th century iranian mosques which were known as चार ताक मॉस्क ये बिल्कुल वही ईरानियन जो कंसेप्ट है उसी को बारो करके हिंदुस्तान में ये बनाया गया था और फॉर दैट मैटर दिस इज यू नो फ्रॉम फतेहपुर सीकरी दी मॉस्क ऑफ फतेहपुर सीकरी टिपिकली स्क्वायर इन फॉर्म लुक है टोटल स्क्वायर चारों तरफ यू नो बिल्डिंग्स यू नो सिंगल यू नो storied you know uh, galleries all around the prayer chamber surmounted with uh, three domes uh, the central dome higher the other domes lower the buland darwaza the badshahi darwaza bastions on the sides but a square between you can see the tomb of salim chishti here 
and the tomb of his son here. Yes. Uh, I'm not going into the details of this, but remember what I'm trying to show is that uh, all these mosques are derived from the Iranian style. Or yehi ek mosque jo aapko main dikha raha hoon. This is also a typical example of a Templar mosque, which I'll uh, I have just explained to you. Uh, the the uh, you know uh, Tughlaq period um, uh, mosque, for example, here is one of the mosques of the Tughlaq period in Delhi. multiplicity of domes a typical tradition of central asia and then here you you find these squares these are open courtyards one two uh, be, uh, behind this and here uh, for example in this plan it is much more clearer here these squares represent the open courtyards and these areas are the built area double story structure uh, the lower story is just a platform uh, the actual mosque is on top of that multiplicity of domes for example there is one mosque uh, having uh, 80 such domes surmounting it and then four courtyards this was a typical style which came to be established under feroz shah tughlaq and there are a number of such mosques which survive and then all of you most of you uh, belong to bengal which i could gather from the names which were coming on my screen so uh, there are these uh, you know mosques are from uh, gor chota uh, sona and another mosque whose name i am forgetting you can see the plans multiples of domes uh, with no courtyard just a quadrangle uh, which is enclosed uh you know remember the climate of the region because it is the region where much rainfall takes place north india is the region where you need air as well as uh, you know sunlight during the winters but here you need more protection so here in the region of bengal i mean this is the type of mosque you will find uh, almost throughout the region of bengal uh, from bangladesh down to the indian bengal you will find the same type of mosque which is very different from the mosques which were built during the sultanate period uh, in north india or during the mughal period uh, in north india now as i said the templar mosques uh, jo even the mosque which i had showed earlier the fatehpur sikri mosque is also belonging to the same variety uh, the, the 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 gradation is there the steps are there how from low you go to the divine uh, step by step one step at a time you reach the ultimate pinnacle so here also you find for example this is in lahore aurangzeb's mosque badshahi mosque at lahore you uh, you know it's all uh, below you can see the gate here large number of steps from below which you climb and you reach the sahan and from the courtyard you again uh, you have to climb three steps to go inside the prayer chamber prayer chamber again divided into two aisles and a uh, central nave the central nave uh, you know in front of that is a very high uh, you know uh, arch a propylon and uh, the dome you can see is higher bigger is flanked by two smaller domes and all around you find the minarets let me also point out here that uh, you know uh, one of the symbols of modern mosque in india uh, you know there are two symbols of modern mosque in india the dome and the minaret uh, but you will be surprised to know that as far as north indian mosques are concerned even bengal uh you won't find any uh, you know minarets related with that hovatul islam mosque there is one minaret that is known as qutub minar which is a structure unrelated with the structure of the mosque it is situated outside the mosque original mosque ultimately it was incorporated within but it was 
a freestanding minaret. It had nothing to do with the structure itself. It was a Maizana tower. I won't go into the details of that. But starting from there, coming up till the reign of Jahangir, there is no mosque uh, where, especially under the Mughals or the North Indian tradition, Sultanate uh, to, to the Mughals, that you would encounter any minaret at all. The minaret for the first time makes its appearance uh, in the Jama Masjid of Agra, a mosque which was built by Jahanara Begum during the reign of Shah Jahan. Stunted minarets, uh, hesitant minarets, but for the first time. In full fledged form, the minaret would appear in the Jama Masjid at New Delhi. And then, as you can see, this is an image of a most beautiful mosque of the Mughals. Incidentally, it is uh, from the reign of Aurangzeb. Generally, you know, uh, what we are told is that Aurangzeb's period was the period of decline. Nothing happened. This most beautiful structure of a mosque was built during the period of Aurangzeb, the Badshahi Mosque. Uh, it is not of Shah Jahan. And here uh, you would find high minarets, four minarets. Delhi ki Jama Masjid maybe there are only two minarets. In Banaras, uh, you know that there, there is a mosque which is related with Aurangzeb. High slender minarets on top of that, which are there. So, in fact, minarets associated with mosque structures make their beginning only from the period of Shah Jahan. And as in these uh, places, for example, where I am saying the Templar mosques, you will find that jo Ek, uh, uh, Indian hierarchy hai, chahe wo, you know, it's of, of our society, of our, uh, you know, uh, Indian philosophy, the, uh, the concept of uh, Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh, you call it in any fashion, you will find it reflected in the mosque architecture, especially of the Mughal variety, uh, you know. Uh, here, again, uh, you find uh, this is the uh, mosque of Delhi uh, from the front. Uh, the hierarchies are very apparent and clear in this. The uh, minarets are uh, clear. Uh, the, the, the central pylon is clear. Uh, the high dome is clear. Uh, the central nave, which is much more decorated from inside also, it's very clear. So, you know, such type of hierarchies and that is why, as I said, that all these mosques are, although basically derived from Iranian architecture, but Indian elements start getting into it, giving it a new form. As far as the tombs are concerned, from the very first tomb, for example, here you find the tomb of Sultan Ghari, the first tomb which was built after the establishment of the Delhi Sultanate, the son of uh, you know, Sultan Iltitwish. And here also, from the uh, first tomb, the structure was generally of a square building. Sultan Ghari, as you can see here, it's a whole structure which is square, but in bit, uh, here, you don't have any construction ex except of a platform. The actual tomb is inside. It's the subterraneous. So, two things are established. Ek, Square uh, tomb bana, dusre pehle tomb se, ek cheez or which came to be established was that generally the actual grave would always be situated within the ground, not above the ground. Above the ground, you would only see the replica. So, here Sultan Ghari, the actual structure is square with a rectangle, uh, with a uh, you know, octagonal platform in. Uh, uh, in between, it represents the, uh, you know, burial chamber which is situated below. This is the tomb of Iltitwish, again square. Uh, if you co come to the, uh, and again, uh, the actual grave of Iltitwish is not here. It is in the subterraneous chamber under the ground. And you would find this, that throughout the Khalji period, the tomb of Alauddin Khilji, the uh, 
uh, any you name the tomb of any sultan which you name they they, they were generally uh, during the uh, uh, you know khalji period even in fact till the beginning of the tughlaq period they were generally square the first octagonal tomb was the tomb of uh, you know khane jahan telangani which i have already mentioned it is in a very bad shape today it's all surrounded from all the uh, sides it is octagonal with chhatris uh, just like here this tomb which you find here uh, which is of the sayyid period in the lodi tomb uh, you find cupolas surrounding a central dome and with verandas surrounding the central chamber so octagonal tombs started from khane jahan telangani the sayyid and the lodi periods in the during the sayyid and the lodi periods generally now what started happening was that square tomb now meant a tomb of a noble and from sayyid and lodi period onwards the octagonal tomb was generally preferred for the sultan and from the period of uh, you know uh, moguls uh, this octagonal tomb became the preferred style i will come to uh, about the actual uh, ground plan of this was but this was the first monumental structure ye sab bahut chote chote structures hain the monumentality to architecture was given under the moguls you can see that it is in fact uh, formed as a square with chamfering on the sides it's known as musamman e baghdadi any uh, uh, an irregular octagon an octagon is something which has eight equal sides for example here in this tomb all sides are equal to each other but in a new type of a plan which came to be preferred under the moguls it was musamman e baghdadi the 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 uh, octagon which was irregular with uh, four sides smaller and four sides larger here at humayun's tomb and then the same thing at the taj and then the last tomb of sardarjan uh, appears to be square but in its planning it is once again you know octagonal in form uh as far as the temples are concerned you know generally when we talk about the medieval period we miss out on the temples i don't know why i mean uh, we we try to show that as if only mosques and tombs and uh, palaces were uh, constructed no a large number of uh, temples were also constructed during the 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 uh, medieval period and one of the most famous temples is uh, the gobindev temple at vrindavan uh if you know uh, i can assure you uh, this is from the outside this is from the inside view and if you go uh, to that uh, uh, temple blindfolded and if i release your blindfolds only after you have entered this you would imagine that you are standing uh, in some mogal monument for example at fatehpur sikri bilkul wahi wahi architecture jo uh, imperial moguls ka architecture tha that was the architecture which was used by man singh and the other rajputs when they were constructing these temples now this is the plan a new type of a plan where the the, the church uh, you know planning in fact uh, the uh, very large uh, you know cross shaped vault uh, uh, what is in the center uh, it's a uh, you know cross shaped building uh, and a new type of architecture and the decorations and the vaultings intersecting arches i'll come to that you can uh, see here that one arch going like this another intersecting here it here uh, these are the new type of uh, you know uh, things which was used even uh, in the uh, temple architecture mai aap bas itna you i'll just remind you know these are the times when we are talking more and more of temples uh, you go to ayodhya recently you must have uh, seen images on your tv of that uh, foundation ceremony which took place at ayodhya but before that ceremony took place they would have shown you you know the sites near the river sarju that beautiful you know series of temples which are built along the river sarju jinko decorate kiya gaya tha all those temples 
uh, if you remember or you go back and check them on the net, they are all having domes, not shikhas. They are all typically Muslim architecture, uh, which you would find because uh, uh, most of them, uh, uh, you know, represent the architecture of the period in which they were being constructed. Now, as far as the architectural Mughal plans are concerned, uh, the first one is Jahar Bagh. That was uh, the first, for the first time introduced in India by Babur. Uh, here, uh, I am depicting before you the famous Bagh uh, Fat, Babur's garden, which he constructed after his victory over Rana Sangha. Um, at Kanwa, battleground of Kanwa. Now it is a part of Fatehpur Sikri. Uh, this low ground which you see, barren ground, is the place where the lake of Sikri is situated. And just besides that lake of Sikri, uh, Babar built this garden. If you are standing on the ground, you will not be able to make out you are, you are standing in a garden. Uh, but if you go on top of the hill from where this uh, photograph has been taken, the whole, you know, uh, uh, four-quartered garden uh, with, a, uh, you know, uh, uh, a platform in between, uh, the, the, the uh, water channels dividing it into four parts are visible. Now, here on this side is one of the Shalimar gardens at Kashmir, step garden in the hilly regions. This was the typical Timurid garden, uh, which they encountered in Central Asia, and it was the same design which they incorporated in the Indian gardens where they started building. And that Indian garden became a site for most of the tombs, and most of the structures, uh, which were, in fact, the whole town of Agra came to be known uh, as, you know, a garden town. Uh, Abakosh, you read Abakosh. Uh, Agra uh, is a plan which is uh, the focal point of which is the Chahar Bhavs, which are laid out besides the river Jamna at Agra. Now, among the buildings, the plan which is preferred, uh, uh, there are two. One is Chahar Taq. I have already referred uh, the Chahar Taq is the plan uh, of a mosque. For example, here uh, you find the uh, 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 plan uh, uh, of, uh, you know, a number of mosques. Uh, this is the uh, mosque of Humayun at Kachpura, Babar's mosque uh, at you know Panipat. Again, a number of structures, and here the famous or infamous Babri Masjid of Ayodhya, which was demolished. In each of them, one point, and here it is a bigger of the same thing. What you find is that instead of pillars very heavy bastions on the four sides and uh, forming a square in between and on top of that using intersecting arches a circular dome has been laid. This is the uh, particular Chahar Taq uh, design uh, which uh, one finds in most of these uh, you know, uh, mosques. For example here the same design here also uh, in the Kabuli Bagh mosque is the plan of the Kabuli Bagh mosque here also, the same Chahar Taq pattern has been used. Here also, you will find the same type of design. And also here in these particular, you know, Central Asian, uh, uh, you know, mosque. Uh, this is, uh, in fact, at Samarkand, the same type of a plan is found. And here, this is the Jama Masjid plan of the Jama Masjid at, uh, you know, Shah Janama, Delhi, which you have just seen here also the same type of a Chahar Taq plan has been used. So uh, among the mosque architecture, the Chahar Taq plan became the most preferred plan. The Khurasanian wall, intersecting arch, what I had sh shown you at the Gobindev temple here, I think it would be much more clearer to you how there are intersecting arches which have been uh, you know, used to convert uh, a square chamber into octagonal and then from octagon to a circle at the top. So this, I'm not going into the details. It's a very complex Khurasanian vaulting system. Uh, as the name suggests, it, uh, this type of a vaulting is derived from Iranian uh, architecture. Here also, 
you find in one of these structures uh, in Lahore, the same type of vaulting, uh, you know, uh, Mukarna's designs and you know, intersecting arches. Uh, these are like a ek arch karke, ye jo, uh, se, ye raise ban jati hai. Uh, you know, the same type of things which is used. This is one of the preferred plants as far as the Mughals. And as far as uh, uh, the secular as well as religious structures are concerned, the most preferred plant throughout the Mughal period was a plant which is known as Hasht Bahisht. It is a non epartite plant. A plant in which there are nine chambers. A centrally located chamber surrounded by eight on the sides. For example, here, this is the plan of the uh, Humayun's Makbara. But here you would find there are four octagons, separate octagons joined by these rectangular pavilions. And char alag alag octagon ko leke amalgamate kar diya gaya hai, forming a central chamber and uh, 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 four you know octagonal chambers on the corners and four you know side chambers so eight uh, chambers uh, out of which four are rect rectangular and four are octagonal the octagonal chambers are double story surmounted with cupel the uh, uh, side chambers on the cardinal directions north south east west uh, these are you know chambers which are rectangular in form the central chamber in between is again a full octagon surmounted with a large dome so whether and this plan uh, was used in uh, you know square buildings for example at etbatuddola but the inner inner planning was the same uh, with nine chambers or for example uh, a monument at Lahore known as Anarkali, uh, uh, this is actually Neeli Gumbad, but in Anarkali's tomb, which is also similarly built. This one is also Neeli Gumbad in Delhi, but a very similar monument in Lahore, uh, Anarkali's tomb, that is also having the same type of a plan. This is the plan of a particular, uh, you know, uh, Hammam in Burhanpur. Again, it's a half octagon, but with the same inner planning, and then the Taj. Now the difference between the plan of Humayun's tomb and the Taj is that here there were four different octagons joined together. Here it is only one octagon which has been divided into nine parts. Uh, here you can see the whole planning that this particular tomb of uh, Humayun which is built on the hushed bahisht plan, the non epartite plan is situated within a Chahar Bagh, a Mughal garden. A garden which is divided just like a grid into squares of four. A large, uh, you know, bulbous central dome with cupolas on each of the side chambers. The side chambers being these ones being double storied, these rectangular ones here, they have been used as portals all around. In the Taj, as you can see, uh, the difference from Humayun's tomb in the plan of the basic structure. Now, instead of four different octagons joined, there is a single chamfer. Uh, irregular octagon internally divided into similar type of chambers. Another difference you would find between Humayun's tomb and the Taj. At the uh, Humayun's tomb, the uh, you know uh, tomb is in the center of the garden. Here it is removed to a side besides the river. So ye kaha gaya ke here you know to give depth to the structure, uh, you have it shifted towards one side. Actually, the fact is that this particular type of a garden continues on the other side. 
now today it is known as Bahtab Bagh. In between is the river, and after the river, you again have a, a very similar garden which was constructed on the other side, and this was the culmination of you know Mughal architecture. Uh, but then the decline started. But even as far as the decline was concerned, one of the last structures to be made was the tomb of Savdarjan. And here, although the same type of things are not found, but still the uh, Hajj Bahish plan, the location of the, the uh, tomb in the center of the garden, uh, the Balbas dome, uh, the Balbas double dome, uh, the Chhatris, derived from you know uh, rajasthani and indian architecture these uh, you know uh, uh, divisions here this type of designing which is being given here uh, uh, the art type of articulation which has been given here is again derived from iranian architecture so we can say that uh, you know the the uh, mughal architecture uh, started uh, you know from from uh, from babar's period down to Saptar Jan's period, uh, there was much development, there were many continuities. Naturally, uh, everything cannot be told in one particular lecture. So let me st stop here. Let me say there is much more to architecture. We are only touching the surface just like laymen. So thank you very much. I hope that uh, I didn't bore you more than what was needed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was a very informative and illuminating lecture. The session is now open to take questions, if any. Please ask questions one by one. Uh, well, uh, there is a question which I could see that uh, why did Binar came only during the period of Jahangir? Uh, well, um, Minaret in the mosque architecture never came under Jahangir. It came only from the period of Shah Jahan onwards. Although we know that uh, in the regional architecture, uh, for example, uh, in the region of Gujarat, it was from uh, very early, say 14th century onwards, that we had minarets. But uh, in North, somehow uh, the minara was never uh, taken to be a part of uh, 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 the mosque architecture at all. Gujarat was naturally uh, uh, one of the examples where uh, the, the, the mosque architecture had minarets and very developed minarets for that particular matter. Now we know that uh, the uh, Sultan of Gujarat was very much present in the Battle of Panipat uh, at a time when uh, Babar defeated uh, uh, Ibrahim Lodi, one of the Rajas along with Ibrahim Lodi who had been defeated was the Sultan of Gujarat. Ultimately he lost his empire and then under Humayun Humayun attacked Gujarat and Humayun, we can say that at least uh, from Humayun's period, there were contacts with Gujarat and ultimately Gujarat was conquered by Akbar. Uh, there were many, many, you know, inspirations which were borrowed from Gujarat architecture by the Mughals, but somehow uh, the minaret was never borrowed and uh, the minaret for the first time, uh, you know, uh, starts only from the period of Shah Jahan. And I can also say, say that uh, the culmination of minaret as part of the Mughal architecture only took place during the period of Aurangzeb. Uh, yes, sir. Any other question? Yes, I, I do have one question. Yes, please go ahead. Um, Nadeem Saab, this is Nazi. Uh, you know, I'm not a student of history. But no, no, please go ahead. Of I think this was meant uh, to be a lecture for those who are not experts. All right. So, um, 
I'm curious to know why the early sultans who basically uh, had, I mean, heritage or they came from Central Asia. And in Central Asia at that time, a lot of mosques had the minaret or very visible domes in Bukhara, Samarkand and all those areas. So when they came and established the Sultanate in Delhi, why the structure were not similar in that, uh, I guess they were not similar the mosques. You are quite right. I mean, uh, uh, let me tell you one thing that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Central Asian and Iranian influence was very heavy, both on the Sultanate architecture as well as Mughal architecture. But uh, there is one another thing which is important to remember, and that is uh, the topographical climatic, uh, you know, differences between the two regions. Uh, in Central Asia, uh, there was a typical type of architecture which was needed as per the climate. In India, the situation was quite different, number one. Number two, when these people came to India, they did not come along with their architects and masons. Some you know, engineers were there, but actual builders